Okay, everybody, we will start, but before we start, we will give you some entertainment. So, do you come here? Come along here. Uh, last year, we produced a music video, All of Us Belong Right Here. So, that's also the same for our Asian American story. So, we will sing together. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. We do some little exercise together. So, follow Joe's body movement. We will sing this together. Okay. How is going to play this on the screen? Yes, play. Yeah, let's uh, let's uh, look at here. Uh, so the sound. Oh. Sound. Yes. Yes. We're gonna gonna sing one one paragraph. Before we start, I would like to uh, recognize and also thanks to the whole team, uh, Dingding TV team and the director of Minjo's team and all the volunteers working together, uh, especially our uh, coordinator and producer, Hao Yue Fang Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And the 
Vasi there, and Joe Wang here, and Clara here. Thank you so much. Jen. And Sun uh, Ray, uh, Hayo Li Ray, uh, Lily, and all of you, thank you. And uh, we're so honored to have all of you working together. So next, I'm going to give the microphone to Hal uh, to give us a short introduction about what is Civic Leadership Forum, Silicon Valley. Hal, microphone is yours. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. So Civic Leadership Forum was created by Ding Ding TV in 2017. And uh, in uh, 2021, under COVID, it was renewed again uh, with uh, Silicon Valley uh, Community Media uh, when everybody was grounded, if you remember that time. Uh, so Civic Leadership Forum is a platform for civic engagement and leadership. And it has involved a, a lot of people for, for the past couple of years, over 2,000 uh, audiences with you know parents, children, uh, community leaders, community leaders as well as you know uh, public officials. Uh, everybody has been involved, and we post this on the web and on YouTube. So we have over uh, I think uh, two million viewers. I mean quite a lot of viewers already at this stage. Um, so. Uh, 200,000 viewers uh, online. Uh, with that, so this is, we have now about four times a year uh, of this forum, and we tackle, you know, different things that uh, to share with the community, sometimes looking to the past, sometimes looking to the present. We share with the um, uh, uh, future generations, between generations, and uh, as well as across different uh, Asian American communities. Uh, with that, welcome today. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to introduce. Thank you. I would like to introduce to you our host for today, um, uh, Claire Wu, and she will uh, take it from here and then take you through the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the Civic Leadership Forum, Silicon Valley. Today's event is sponsored by Ding Ding TV, Silicon Valley Community Media, and History Channels for Chinese Americans. I'm your host today, Claire Wu. It's great to see such a uh, wonderful turnout for this event. It's a, I know everybody put a lot of time and effort to organize this event. Today is the 70, uh, 78th anniversary of VJ Day. And also, we are com commemorating 170 year history of Chinese American sacrifices and contributions to America. We are lucky enough to view three new documentary films by our director, Ming Zhou. The three films are One Mile Walk, My 58 Uncles, and Born to Fly. To get started, let's give a big round of applause to Diane Nadine, the founder of Silicon Valley Community Media and Indie TV for the Open Statement. Please have the stage, Diane. Thank you so much, Claire. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you so much. I know many people coming from far away. Uh, some people from San Francisco, stand up and say, raise up your hand from San Francisco. Yeah, thank you. And some friends are from uh, Monterey Bay, and uh, uh, yeah, this morning they come really early uh, from where? You told me. Yes, uh, Li, Li Rui. Yes, from a far, really far away. And some of our friends even from Sacramento. So Sacramento friends, Raise up your hand. Lily, right, thank you. Um, yes, uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, all these years, Stinging TV, Silicon Valley Community Media has committed ourselves in telling Asian American stories, especially during the COVID. We know it's really important to share our stories and to understand each other, to appreciate difference 
because we, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans, we are the contributors. We are not the takers. We are the givers. We are the contributors. But we have to tell our story. So we're so uh, lucky and so honored to have so many friends joining us together. And thanks to former assembly member Kaisen Chu and DC Chu for coming. And thank you. And uh, my friend uh, Danny Su, Jeff Lee, and coming all the way from San Francisco, and also Veterans uh, Club, Wine Club, and many other history clubs. And you are all my VIP members, Sister Fen Honghua, for supporting us all these years, 20 years. Thank you so much. So everybody are VIP. I'm not going to mention each one of them, but today's uh, film is very important. So I'm going to invite our director, and let's, I'm going to just mention a little bit about Ming Zhou. Actually, I know her for over 10 years, a very hardworking lady, and also uh, very determined, sometimes stubborn, but very talented. <laughs> and she, after, you know, she's a very active filmmaker and a journalist in San Francisco Bay Area has been re researching Chinese American histories for the last eight years. Ming has won a lot of film awards internationally and nationally. And now she's working on three documentary films. Today we're gonna watch uh, half of the film and watch two other trailers because we don't have time to watch the whole film. But we will uh, inform you and please do pay attention to all the events we organize. And uh, we're gonna have uh, this event as a series. So with this, let's welcome our director and filmmaker, Ming Zhou, to the stage. Yeah, thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Today I'm going to just show you half of my productions, uh, even though there are three films, but they are produ productions in progress. The first one is half produced. Um, I'm going to show you the 30 minutes version, English version of one my work. That's about uh, Monterey Bay history. That's a history I didn't know three years ago uh, until Jerry told me about that. However, I was distracted back then. I was interested in the railroad history. I didn't follow up with Jerry, but that's the thing I regret to death. Because one day, suddenly, I found out Jerry passed away. That's, I, that's why I feel I owe her such a film. So I produced the, the short documentary first to dedicate to Jerry, to commemorate her 10 years of journey, walking along fighting along. And this one mile is very symbolic. It's just a beginning for our Chinese Americans. And we think we still have a long way to go. And thank you so much for your coming. And all I want to say is included in this field. Thank you. I met Jerry only once, but I hope that 
She passed away, I feel like half of me is gone. That's why when I come down here and I talk about her, I get really emotional about her because I miss her. I actually worked in the farms here in Salina Snelly. And then in 1971, I went to Cal State University Hayward. It was there in 1971 that I met Jerry, probably the most beautiful Chinese woman that I had seen in a long time. And in fact, I proposed to her on campus uh, when we were seniors. And her first response to me, if you're crazy, we're not even, we haven't even graduated from college yet. Why are you asking me this? I first met Jerry in 2004, when I had just become the library director at Monterey Public Library. One afternoon, I had a staff person come up to me and say, there's a woman who's very concerned about a swarm of bees in the parking lot. And I went down to talk to her, and it turned out to be Jerry. And so we started a conversation that soon became very warm and friendly. And she was asking me if I knew about the history of the Chinese in Monterey. And I knew a little bit. She started telling me stories of her ancestor Kwok Moy and her family in the fishing village. And I realized, oh my goodness, there was so much more to be learned about that. 2004 was also when California State University Monterey Bay, I think it was their teledramatics department, had just finished By Light of Lanterns, which was a story about the Chinese fishermen and fisher people in Monterey. And um, Jerry was telling me about that, and we wound up um, inviting her to give the first showing of it in Monterey at the Monterey Public Library in October of 2004. So she began to piece together the picture. What was 
And intriguing to Terry was how come nobody ever spoke about it in school? Why did she have to learn about it by accident? I could feel kind of like the presence of the Chinese here. Um, they built this building in the 1850s. Kwok uh, Moy was born here. Um, Jerry used to come here every time we were in Monterey. And um, she would come to visit the picture of Kwok Moy and, and the building itself. It's just not a building. This used to be somebody's house. If here's a person who's a descendant of the person who used to live here. Some of them have something written on the front of them with an accession number, some of them don't. But most of them you know that he did. So if we could find that number, we might be able to track it down and find the original negative and then take it that way. Some memento 
of Old Town, which had stood on the shore of the bay for so many a year. The ruins were searched for money and any curios looking things that they could find they took away with them. The ruins were still smoldering in some places. It was one of those disgraceful affairs that could not be foreseen. showed kindness to those who were affected. Ladies and gentlemen occupying fine residences offered and took Chinese women and children home with them for the night and cared for them. Mayor Will Jacks of the city took a Chinese mother and a babe of but a few hours old and the entire family of six into his automobile and carried them over to Pacific Grove and made them comfortable in one of his cottages. The area that the Chinese settled, I believe that there is some evidence that they first settled around the Pacific Grove coastline before the Americans came. They settled when it was under um, Mexican rule, I believe. And they, um, then the land, when the Americans came, the Pacific Improvement Company and Mr. Jacks, oh, I'm gonna take this land, and now everybody who's using this land has to pay me the rent, because I'm now the landlord. So the Chinese then shifted over and paid the rent to Mr. Jacks. Well then Mr. Jacks said, now I'm gonna make my money, I'm gonna sell it to the Pacific Improvement Company. That was the, that was what Pebble Beach was beforehand. <laughs> well, this was just sort of abandoned coastline that nobody really saw any use for um, until the trains came through. And then once the train came through, then there was this idea that, oh, because people were interested in going and visiting other areas, so it could become tourism. And then it could become pieces of property they could sell for homes. So at that point in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was no longer convenient to collect rent for fishermen because you could make a lot more money selling off the land for a house or selling off the land for tents or a hotel. Even though the Chinese fishermen had paid rent and had done everything they could within their very limited options to exist there. Big companies started buying up this land, and one of them was the Pacific Improvement Company. So they bought up the land. The Chinese, as far as I know, could not purchase their own land. So I believe that it was the smell of their fish that was part of the reason that was given is why we have to kick them off. Because they've been doing this for decades and there weren't a lot of people around them when they were doing it. And it used to be Carmel by the sea, Pacific Grove by God, because Pacific Grove was a Methodist church retreat, and Monterey by the smell. And so it was, again, the canneries made of terrible odors, and they had drying fish in it and everything else, but nobody said, let's take the canneries. Right here, Rainline and Wilbur. Okay, 
rain is really cold with Jerry's great grandfather was one of the last to leave the village. He fought. Um, there were a number of other Chinese who refused to go, and they fought being evicted. They finally decided that they would give up their lawsuit. But as a condition of that lawsuit, they agreed to move the village again. That last village is where Jerry's mother was. Well, we, for an aunt, who was 106, still alive, was also, you know, born in that village. She's the only living person who was born in that village. Chinese people in the fishing village did things disappear when the village was burned. They figured out a way to stay around. They persevered, making contributions in a positive way. But one of the things that I learned, not from Jerry necessarily, but in my research um, on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force, was that the year before the village was burned was the first year that the Feast of Lanterns took place. And so the second year that the Feast of Lanterns took place, in the summer after the village had been burned, less than half a mile away, when members of the fishing village were still trying to occupy the buildings, still trying to make a legal claim that they still had rights on that property, even though, as Chinese, they're not allowed to testify in court. All of the federal and state laws, rules, and regulations against the Chinese were so horrible, so dehumanizing. There was a local event in Pacific Grove called the Feast of Lanterns. It is a, an event that the local community puts on. At the end of the Feast of Lanterns, they have a play that they perform uh, on the beach. And it's basically a, a play that was written by a Caucasian, and yet it's a story about an Asian family. The primary actors are Caucasian. They dress up in Chinese costumes. And earlier, when this play was going on, some of the participants would paint their faces yellow, or they would kind of like put makeup on their eyes to slant their eyes. And this doesn't happen now, but this happened, you know, uh, it did happen. Jerry didn't like the play, and she tried to get it changed. She approached the organizers of the Peaceful Lanterns, and they listened to work, but they never, they never changed it. They didn't have the strength of character that Jerry did to actually go to the Feast of Lanterns nonprofit board and say, this isn't right, you need to change this. I mean, I think Jerry was ahead of her time.
remember Jerry telling me about um, how it was very hard for some of her relatives when she started talking about this. And they would say, why are you making a fuss? You know, don't talk about this. So to me, part of it is that fear that this happened. This really happened in our family's history. So maybe we're still afraid about it. I was telling my father about why I thought this was important. And he said, in 1972, we wanted to look at Pebble Beach because your mother wanted some property and have a garden and things. And the real estate agent told your mother, who was American, but not me, I don't think you'd be comfortable in Pebble Beach. They're not very kind to Asian people there. Again, to me, that's not past history. That's pretty good. I had seen some pushback from our own community, the Chinese community, about an apology. And a lot of folks were saying, what good's an apology gonna do? Why are you bringing this up now? I would tell them that it's important to do this now, and it's a message to the community that what was done in the past, and even what's done now, is not right. It was a very emotional process for me to go from really being a champion of the organization and being the president and being a past queen to really realizing the harm it was causing and then recognize I could lead the organization in the direction that was meaningful. If the Peace Atlantic still existed, the stories would not be centered in the way that they need to. Pacific Grove, finally, adopted an apology resolution well, after you know 170 years they adopted this resolution and Pacific Grove is like one of only five cities in the state of California that approved an apology resolution all the news on her Facebook page that she had actually passed. Um, it was very difficult. So she has a huge loss to the community. participate 
So next we are going to have our first panel discussions, Chinese Americans One Mile, moderated by Joe Wong, President of National Asian American United and Board Member of Silicon Valley Community Media. Everyone please give a warm welcome to Joe. Uh, what a movie. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit, uh, in, in, in interest of time, we have a big, uh, you know, you, we'll give you the link, you can just finish the movie, but you get this. Okay. Right now, I want to welcome Randy Sabado and the movie maker, Min Zhao, here. What, what a movie. <laughs> First of all, okay. what a movie. Uh, there's a very rich history of Asian American, Chinese American in this country. We need to tell. Story. First of all, I want to ask the movie maker, Ming Zhao. Uh, I know you, I personally have met Jerry, and unfortunately, uh, we never have a chance to talk about, you know, the background. Uh, I know you were motivated to make this movie after you met her. Tell us about some of the interesting things, and some of the difficult things that you encountered when trying to research to make this movie. I think the most interesting thing is that I met Jerry three years ago, and she mentioned the Chinese fishing village history to me. And even though I was not very realized how important this history was, but I just kind of, mm, wait, this is on my list to do, and I will, I will cover this story better. But most challenging thing is that time, fly, time flies. And I didn't have time to catch up the story and Jerry passed away. So that's why I feel so so emotional every time when I think about this. I think I owe her such a film. Uh, Randy, uh, 
tell us something about more personally, more personal that you and Jerry, you know, as man and wife, when she discover her heritage, when she discover her grandmother, that uh, how 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 did that happen? Well, I wasn't sure if it was covered in the documentary, but um, Jerry had some family uh, relatives come from out of state, and they came to uh, Point Lobos, and Jerry accompanied them, and they were looking in the whaler's cove uh, in the cabin, and they saw this picture of these Chinese, this Chinese woman in the back, and they didn't know who she was, uh, but as, this, as the documentary says, Jerry noticed in the background there were um, uh, Kwok Moy was standing behind or in front of a building that had these wooden slats on it, and Jerry recollect that her grandmother's house had that same thing. So that's when she first was curious about, you know, who is this woman? And that's when she went back home and asked her, her mother about, you know, this Chinese woman. And that's when she found out that Kwok Moy was her great grandmother, wow. and that that started her on her quest. What a story, yeah. Uh, uh, you know. In, uh, I am very moved by this, you know. Can you tell us something more about her journey of discovering the uh, heritage, her ancestor? Well, Jerry had a you know difficult time in trying to find the history from her own relatives, as the documentary says. She would talk to her relatives, her aunt, as I said in the you know, the documentary, she has an aunt who's a hundred and just turned hundred and seven and she's still alive. And Jerry would go and talk to her and ask her about the village. And her aunt would, would refuse to talk about it. She'd just say, you know, that's past history. We don't want to bring that up. Why are you talking about this? Um, and, you know, Jerry kept, you know, talking to her about it. And she would get bits and pieces of information. But um, she was really amazed that her family didn't talk about it and that she found out about it, you know, basically by accident. Um, and it always bothered her, I think, in a bit that, you know, that her family was not comfortable in talking about what had happened to them. Uh, Min, uh, you talked about a whole lot of history here there. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey, you know, who do you have to meet to get all this history uh, documented on the film? Okay, so in the process of producing this film, the first person on tap was Wendy. Because I think, uh, yeah, I got, I got to approach to him, let him know I would like to make a story about Jerry. Because I owe Jerry such a film. And Randy was very, very hospital and very friendly. I still remember two years ago, I participated in the, the banquet, right? Banquet in Monterey Bay to commemorate Jerry's life, to celebrate her life. And I was invited, and, and that's a time to meet a lot of people. And I approached each of them, each of them, and say, "I'm going to make a story. Can you help me? Can you accept my interview?" And if, if somebody says yes, I would say, "Okay, what time? What date?" <laughs> so just a step, a step, a step closer to the people. And I think um, I think I have interviewed ready for at least six times, right? At least six. Times. At least six times. I really appreciate that because every time I go for ready recording, uh, Jerry. It's kind of painful, right? But Randy is just so collaborative. And he opened up his family story and Jerry's family story over and over again to me. No matter what I approach him, he always gives me first response. So I think without Randy's help, I won't be able to make this film. Right? And also, this is what you just, uh, just saw is a short documentary about this fishing bridge history. Actually, the history is, is kind of 150 years longer. So I'm doing a feature documentary about this fishing village. So please continue supporting me. <laughs> Randy, uh, this must be very personal to you, the story. Uh, I know that your eyes are welling up and this is okay. <laughs> Man can cry, can shed a tear too. Uh, I know you miss Jerry a lot. Uh, what do you hope, you, you know, to carry on her heritage? Uh, what what will you do? Uh, this is uh, very difficult for me because 
Um, this coming Thursday will be two years since Jerry passed away. Um, so September is, is very difficult for me. But um, what's made it a little bit more bearable is that um, I uh, will be a grandfather for the first time uh, in September. Uh, and it's going to be a, a baby girl. Her name is going to be Catherine. And I can hardly wait to tell her about her grandmother. Um, she had so much um, impact on the, you know, the community of Monterey. Um, she was an educator. Um, um, I, you know, we were married for 42 years. Um, so it's, it's still um, painful for me to, to watch this stuff in the church. But um, I appreciate, you know, all the work that men did. No. So how long did it take you to make this documentary? Uh, Pretty soon. Because <laughs> for this film, I've been working like over two years. Okay. And I'm thinking in the late of August, no, late, late October, I will collect my production team again and we'll rush to Monterey Bay. Be ready, ready. Okay. <laughs> and there's a good news to, to share with you. Uh, as I close in my statement, uh, in my official documentary, there is an important scene. You know, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, they land a penguin, a baby penguin, Jerry. <laughs> to film this scene, to film this scene, my team covered 1,200 miles one day, because we had to rush back from El Paso, Texas, to Monterey Bay, and we only had one, one day. But we did it. So please wait for my new film about the, the baby penguin named Jerry. <laughs> Very well. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to close my interview here. I just want to put a little bit of commercial because Ding Ding TV, Silicon Valley Community Media are going to have a whole video contest on telling Asian American stories. We'll talk to you a little bit more about, and hopefully all of you can join up, you know, our, 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 our contest and promote it, and let the story of Asian American be told. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, some great discussions and insights. Uh, next, we are going to give everyone a 10 minute break to stretch and use the restroom. And please come back at 4 30. All right? Thank you. 
Let's go. We're going to have another session begin in two minutes. Please come back and find your seat. Thank you. Chinese boys. They learn to fly well, these Chinese. They have something to fight for. 
They remember the smoking ruins of their villages back home. They remember the rape of Nancy. On July 7th, 1937, fighting broke out on this bridge between Chinese and Japanese troops. Within days, Japan launched a full-scale invasion of China. The Pulse Cemetery is that section where the Chinese kids are buried. That section square there by the rock walls, that's the original part of the cemetery. Without the sacrifice, we couldn't be in a different world. 我以前知道那边有五十多个墓碑了周围有一个强烈的对比旁边很多美国军人有家属有花束在中国军人的那一块那个时候啥都没有我就觉得这些人从遥远的中国到这里来为了国家在训练中
，牺牲了他们的生命，应该有人记得他们。那这些空军呢，埋在那里七十多年了，他们就像飞到海外异国他乡的一群大雁，再也回不到家了，就是。我就跟朋友说，跟我哥说，我这件事情一定要做到底，应该把他们都当成自己的二叔。来，说来啊，这家。从家庭来说，如外公刺激很大，儿子突然没了。Thank you for watching. Please support us in making this documentary. My TV. Watching the full film, it's really touching. So now we are going to have our sec second panel section: Chinese sacrifices and contributions to the America. Moderated by Diane Nadine. Diana, please come up to the stage and introduce your panelists. Please. To our panel discussion, let me invite our panelists to the stage. Uh, our assembly member Kenson Chu from 2014 to 2020 to the stage, please. And and Director Ming Zhou, please come to the stage. Thank you.
and Ang Li, the author to the Y50 Echoes, yeah, to the stage, please. Thank you. such a great honor when we watch this film and we're so touched. So it's not only your ankle, it's everybody's ankle. It's my ankle, it's everybody's ankle. That, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for coming and stay with us for so long. I know that many of you are so busy and you sacrifice your family time and coming to this and I really want to show my appreci appreciation to all of you. So let's start this. Uh, so the First question will be for Ali. So Ali, actually, you wrote the book "Die Young and and Forgotten in the in the States." Your second uncle, who passed away uh, at at age of twenty five, with a group of uh, uh, you know young Air Force being trained in in, in the United States. So what made you started this research and writing this book? Uh, this is a start from 2018. Now, uh, since I was I was young, and uh, I know I have an uncle, and uh, joined the Air Force side in the United States, but uh, my parents never told us why he there and why how he died. So until we uh, went to uh, went abroad and start to study, and then my other uncle in our family in China just uh, asked us to start to looking for searching for the second uncle. Then all our family start to um, try our best until we found the uncle. Mm, from uh, another um, relatives in Taiwan and uh, found my uncle buried in El Paso, Texas. So after that, and uh, many of our family members, my cousin, my brother, and uh, all went there. Until like uh, 2008, I was there and found that there are so many Chinese Air Force buried in the Texas. In their headstone, there are no flowers so long for more than 78 years. So I swear in front of my uh, uncle's headstone, I just say, I need to bring all your comrades back home. So after that, and, uh, we just uh, start the search. Thank you for sharing this touchy story, and thank you for this uh, effort. I think this has totally changed your, your life, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, but thank you. And so Assembly Member Kensin Chu, and he's been very active in your community, but uh, very few people know that his father is also one of the cadets, belongs to the class 15 as a Chinese Air Force, got trained in the United States. Not only that, and his family relatives, his uncles, uh, his, uh, his auntie's uncle, well, your, your, mom's, your, your mother's uncle, your mother's uncle is Sun Li Ren Jiangjun, Sun Li Ren. So we all know that a very famous commander uh, leading the, the troop against the Japanese at, uh, during the World War II. So that's uh, the story never told him. And please share with us something about that. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for coming. It's really an honor to share the stage with three of the, uh, uh, my very admirable uh, ladies. And, and the young, I just learned that uh, he actually was referred to by General Stilwell's uh, grandson uh, when, when she was doing the research of the book. And uh, uh, John Easterbrook mentioned that, hey, there's a, 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 a set state assembly member and his father was one of the flying tigers. So that's how we, we met. And uh, uh, I, I think at that time, we're trying to get this family member to come to the United States. And they have some uh, visa issue, right? 
and then we'll have to write those letters to allow those family members to, to come to the United States. Um, uh, to my regret, I didn't join her to visit Fort Bliss in, in, in Texas. I know they're buried uh, 54? 52. In 52. Texas. As a fight. Uh, and then in, uh, in Georgia. Alabama, Georgia? Georgia. In, in Georgia. Five in Georgia. So 52 in full bit. And I also learned his second uncle, uh, the, the Jahe, was in the same class of my father. They actually came to the United States on the same boat. You know, so a lot of the journey that my father never shared with me, I have to learn it from, from her book. I truly, truly admire her effort. I mean, there was so many obstacles that really beyond your imagination. Because when they carved the, 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 the tombstone, the gravestone, sometimes they missed one uh, letter. They misspelled the, the, the letter. Uh, of those uh, fallen cadet, and and the family members in China, because of the misspelling, will not want to recognize. They say, "No, I don't want to recognize. This is not my my uh, ancestor. This is not my father. This is you know not my uncle or whatever." So they have to put in so much effort to to go through the file and to verify that this is your family member, and just because they, they misspelled or they, whatever, they made a mistake on, on, on your name, but this is really your family member to unite um, so many family members. And I, I read from the book, they, because of the war, uh, after the, 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 the Civil War, right, after the, the, the uh, 1939, so many family members are separated, and and the end had actually united them together, you know, because during in her effort to to search for the family member of those 58 uh, falling cadets. So she, you know, I um, I got a book from uh, uh, autographed a book from her, and I also uh, bought I don't know my many books and share with my brothers and share with my friends. And this is really a, a must-read book, and you learn so much about the, the suffer, the atrocity that happened, the challenge that our, our the, the Chinese or China as a nation suffered during that period of time. So I'm really, really uh, happy to be here with uh, with all of you. And uh, uh, Diana mentioned that my Grand uncle, my mother's uncle, is General Sun Li Ren. How many of you uh, uh, learned, of, know, heard about General Sun Li Ren? Oh, okay. Well, got another few hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is uh, the, he fought shoulder to shoulder with General Stilwell uh, in the CBI theater. Uh, how many of you heard about CBI theater? Right, because when we when you learn about, well, it, this is the uh, Chinese, I mean, the Americans, our students here, uh, when they learned about World War II history, they learned a lot about the European theater, what happens in Europe, you know, the D-Day, the, the so on and so forth. The only two pages talk about the Pacific theater. And there's a few sentences talk about the rape of Nanking, which you, uh, you, you saw in, in the movie. But there's really no word to describe what happens in the CBI theater. The CBI theater is really a major theater that turned the uh, Sino-Japanese war around. The CBI theater uh, is really stands for China, Burma, and India. You know, because at that time, the, the, the Chinese uh, um, is pretty, very much rely on the air transport to, to, to supply the, 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 the civilians or, and the troops in Sichuan, Yunnan, Guizhou, uh, those provinces. But it was very, very challenging to fly over the hump, which is the Alps. Uh, Alps. So 
the supply is very, very scarce and very, very hard to go to the Hofang, the, the Sichuan uh, uh, provinces. So the only way that later on, when Sun mm -hmm. they opened up a China Burma India highway, the Zhongying Konglu, and that opened up the, the, the land transport of so many supplies that, that, they, that we can, uh, I think it was first shipped to India and from India, from, from the port, and used the road to transport all those the supplies of weaponry and food and whatever to Yunnan, to uh, Guizhou, to Sichuan, to continue to, to uh, put for the uh, troops and as well as the civilian. So, you know, when I was uh, um, working for uh, Senator Elaine Alpes, we we'll have a proposal. We, we actually passed the uh, the Senate House to increase the, the in the U.S. history in, in the United States to increase more um, history in the Pacific Theater and include some of the 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 the, the, the story and and the triumph that that the U.S. troops and the Chinese troops. That jointly achieved during the CBI theater, but um, due to a strong opposition from the Japanese government, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, that building would have been past the, uh, the the assembly house. So this is something that I think um, that we can all continue working on it, and hopefully we we can teach our generation about the uh, history about the World War II, and I truly believe that the reason we're doing that is to make sure that the history will not repeat itself, because this is a very, this is a human atrocity. I think I go over my time limit, I thank you very much for now. <laughs> giving me the, uh, the key, so I will pass my microphone. So thank you, thank you, Mr. Kershaw, too. Um, you are, this is so important. Important that we tell the story to our next generation, and today we're so happy that we have a, our next generation 